Good evening and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Rashmita and I'm the event planner for Microsoft Reactor Mengaluru, India. And today we are back with another session from Azure Happy Hours. But before we start the session today, I would like you all to read our code of conduct. We are all here to learn together. So please be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, being kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat will be open throughout, and we do encourage you all to participate. With this, I would now like to hand over the floor to Vivek. Over to you, Vivek. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmita. Um, welcome to Azure Happy Hour. I don't know what, what is the episode or what is the season, because Azure Happy Hour has been running for three years now. <laughs> so uh, welcome and online audience as well. Uh, welcome to the show. And uh, today we have uh, three different topics. Uh, and uh, the first topic is on container apps and uh, the second from Nish, uh, who is a program senior program manager. And, uh, and you can obviously hear uh, from him and the amazing demos he has. And the second uh, topic we're going to cover is the Azure Functions uh, from a serverless perspective, uh, what you can build with Azure Functions. And we will again see a couple of demos. And the last talk uh, will be uh, on the IoT specifically from digital twins. So we're going to cover a bunch of things in this next one and a half hours to two hours. So uh, we'll go through that. And uh, first up, I'm going to bring in Nish. Uh, Nish, you can come online. So Nish is joining us from different place, right? So I'm going to yeah. move to the screen here. I'm going to bring you on screen, Nish. OK. So you're on screen hey, here. everyone in Bengaluru. Very nice to see you all. And hello to everyone else joining from the rest of the world. Uh, very happy to have you all here. So Nish is going to talk about uh, the container wraps. And uh, obviously, um, it's a very interesting uh, interesting uh, feature we have and uh, service which we have. And uh, Nish, over to you. Uh, I just don't want to waste time. So let's get started. And then we have a couple of more talks which is coming in. So let's get it started. OK, thanks, Vivek. Wonderful, everyone. Let's talk about Azure Container Apps. So we have this serverless month that's happening here uh, at Microsoft, and we are all talking about serverless, um, you know, uh, platforms. And you probably would have heard about Azure Functions being the serverless offering from Microsoft. But there's also, which is one of my favorites, which is Azure Container Apps, which I'm going to talk about at Inland today. So my name is Nish. I work on the uh, developer uh, community. I'm a PM, and uh, I work on various aspects of um, uh, you know microservices uh, development, enterprise guidances, and things like that. Uh, so one of my favorite things is Azure Container Apps. Uh, so we'll look at that, and uh, let's get started. Like you know, one of the uh, things that we talk about is uh, you know the app of the future is cloud native. Uh, so what it means is 50% of organizations will use applications built on managed services, including cloud native technologies, by 2024. So what that means is that you know we are all relooking, uh, rethinking how we're building applications for the cloud. Uh, the times then we used to build for applications, uh, we used to build applications which were run on VMs or you know uh, somewhere on the data centers and things like that, which were pretty easily approachable in certain certain form. Now we're thinking in terms of like how do we make use of the cloud and the cloud infrastructure as a whole. Right. Uh, so when we talk about cloud native uh, development, why is it so important? Well. I mean, you probably would have seen about uh, if you have used applications in the past, especially the enterprise ones and and, and uh, something like a financial ones, uh, there used to be something called as downtime maintenance time. People used to say, okay, we are down between this time to this, this time, so please come back and visit later. We, often, we don't see that anymore, right? Because things have changed because we want to run businesses 24 seven because you may, your business may be running in one, one city, one country to other geolocations and things like that too. So you want to scale faster. Uh, and you also want to achieve greater resiliency, which means like now that uh, your application is distributed in nature, you really want to be making sure that you know uh, you are up and live most of the time. Uh, and that gives you uh, credibility on your business, right? And also, 
thinking in terms of like, how do you deliver apps faster, right? Now it's all about making sure your feature that you're building uh, gets to your customers quicker. If there is a bug in production, that has to be fixed much, much faster. And you obviously have to secure uh, your environments and, and protect um, uh, your app and businesses and your customers too. Right now, when you start building cloud native applications for uh, for your businesses, when you look at Azure, there's a plethora of offerings out there, right? Obviously, we are talking about serverless today. So that's uh, Azure Kubernetes Service, uh, which is a managed Kubernetes. There's also Azure Functions, which is the most popular form of serverless that you would have heard all, already about. But Azure Container Apps went uh, GA a few months ago, and uh, we want to talk about that today, right? And uh, obviously, there are other cloud native technologies like the managed databases. When you want to use a Cosmos DB, you want to have really high, um, uh, you know, availability of your databases and things like that. Uh, and, and of course, when you look at Microsoft as a as a developer company, we build the best in class developer tools, which is Studio, VS Code, uh, and other things. So we have those amazing uh, technologies out there, including GitHub for CI/CD and things like that. And obviously, security and community, they all are baked into, it's all part of the uh, Azure. So you have the uh, great strength to build uh, amazing apps. Now, we've seen this. I mean, if you are like me, uh, building apps for past 15 to 18 years, you on the left side, what you see is something which we have already uh, been used to, which is like having a front end, a back end, uh, and then there's a database, right? <clears throat> now, this is called the entire architecture or uh, also in, in, in form, some form, if it is constructed in, in, a, in a form where they're all packaged together, it is nothing but a monolithic application. Most often you have the front end and back end together uh, in, a, in a VM, and then you may have a database separately accessed by these, uh, uh, these services, right? Now, the challenge with that is, you know, if you want to scale your application, you probably have to think in uh, how are you going to scale this in the uh, in a probably you know in a cloud environment. You will actually scale VMs, and the problem with that is you will go with heavy underutilization of resources, uh, and also it becomes very very heavy. Just give me one second. I, I see a lot of noise that's coming in, so I'm going to mute Vic. Uh, Vic, just come out of mute whenever you are uh, you want to come back speaking. So I'm just going to mute you right now. Okay. So it feels good now. I hope. Uh, OK, cool. All right, so, so that's about monolithic applications. And even though we used to build applications in a modular fashion, so for example, you would split Let's say let's take an e-commerce application. You probably would uh, you know split it into an order. Uh, you split it into cart separately. You'll split it into customers and things like that. But they all were packaged together in a single deployable unit, and that is the key problem with this uh, this uh, architecture for scalability, right? But then that's still if you are someone who's still building applications like that, it may be great for your business. So it's it's not a comparison that this is better than the other. But when you look really look at if you want to make use of the cloud infrastructure, then you are looking at scaling up certain aspects of your application. And that's where these uh, there's 12 factor apps and other uh, patterns that came in picture and containers and other technologies kind of like boosted these things up which is like, you know, you can package your applications into an immutable unit, which is like, take your code, your configurations, your deployable stuffs into a single image. And now those images can become containers when they are run uh, and they can be run uh, independently. So you technically, if you look at on the right side, that's the microservices architecture that I was talking about. You, you design your uh, applications, you break them down into business based on business complexity, and then you create those uh, services like, for example, orders, inventory, customers. Uh, important aspect is they are, uh, you know, separated by the database itself. So, in a, in a monolithic ar architecture, you the the single largest bottleneck to your application is the database itself, right? So everything is split into tables. So you have relations built up and things like that. But when it comes to microservices, you even go ahead and uh, and split the databases, and no two services can you know, connect to each other's database. Uh, or And if, even if they want to connect, they can only connect via the uh, services or service endpoints, watch which the services uh, expose. So that is the advantage that you get there. And with containerizations and things like that, you can scale independent aspect of those, um, those services. So whenever uh, on a particular, say, uh, a sale day, you can actually scale up all your payment services, your order services, and things like that, and your web endpoints, and separately, uh, than you know some of the services that you may not want to run it on a regular basis or a, or something on a on a sale day definitely right 
So you have these advantages. So how do you take advantage of this? Uh, you know, these these this new world of microservices is is to start rethinking how you will build applications and make use of this cloud infrastructure, right? And let's talk about Azure Container Apps. I mean, I mean. <clears throat> Kubernetes has become the de facto standard, right? When you talk about microservices, people talk about uh, Kubernetes and how you build applications to Kubernetes and things like that. When we speak to our customers, the biggest challenge that we feel, uh, we felt from them is the is the pure, uh, uh, you know, complexity that Kubernetes brings in, the learning curve that involves uh, by for developers, especially someone who's building applications, you're more now worried about the infrastructure, you're, you're trying to understand the infrastructure code, you're going and learning a new, uh, probably a language, a new understanding of how these VMs are managed, how there are nodes, how parts, uh, and there's this huge amount of, uh, uh, you know, um, in, uh, infrastructure related ones that you need to learn. And, 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 and while this has to be in your DevOps pipeline, and this has to go in that areas, if when you start programming itself, you start to have to think in terms of like how this is going to be uh, built on Kubernetes and things like that, right? So that's why Azure Container App comes into picture, which is where you do not think about Kubernetes at all. Uh, Azure Container Apps is nothing but the serverless containers for microservices, which is which means as the name says, it's serverless. So you don't worry about your infrastructure at all, but they are containerized, which means your application is still packaged in the way you would think of packaging them into wherever the containers are going to run, for example, Kubernetes. So Azure Container Apps, Apps is built on top of Kubernetes. It kind of abstracts away all those uh, uh, all those um, things Kubernetes brings in. You only think about uh, writing your code, packaging them, and I'll show you how with some two, three simple uh, lines of code, you can actually deploy them uh, into your uh, Azure. And think of it like a platform as a service. So if you are someone who wants to get to Kubernetes, uh, this may be your first step uh, in, involved in uh, you know packaging applications and and not worry about infrastructure. And then whenever um, uh, you're ready that you want to have that fully managed Kubernetes, something like AKS, you can also extract it out and then go to uh, AKS if you want to, right? Or if you are simple applications and services, what all that you you're looking at is like I want to. Uh, have an end-to-end -end, uh, communication between services. I want to have uh, traffic management, or I want to, um, you know, uh, scale on demand. Uh, these are the features that you are really looking at. Not worrying about the infrastructure. Then Azure Container Apps is a great way uh, to get started with. So I'll talk about a little more in depth about a few things. Like for example, it's built um, for the modern apps on the open source technology. So it uses technologies like. Um, Envoy, Envoy proxy for uh, the ingress management. So one of the challenges at Kubernetes is to kind of like giving you a, putting an ingress in front and exposing them uh, uh, to the public as well as for service to service communication that is internal communications as well, right? So you add an ingress objects and things like that. Now here with Azure Container Apps, it comes with Envoy proxy by default. So when you deploy to Azure, you automatically get the ingress enabled uh, and then you get a link. You can design, decide if it is an, uh, it's an internal or an external. And if you have a port that is being exposed then you configure that, that's about it. And then you get those things configured by default, right? And it's also built on something called Dapper. Uh, sorry, it's not built on Dapper. It provides you features for Dapper. So Dapper is is a is a nice uh, technology where uh, you do uh, one of the key things with microservices is that you do service to service communication. And when you want to build service to service communication, there are multiple ways. You you have a synchronous endpoint, so using HTTP or gRPC, or you may have an asynchronous endpoint, which is like using service buses, uh, messaging queues, and things like that. So uh, you know, for the cloud, when you're doing, you're thinking about resiliency. So one service is running, other service may be down for an interim period. So you are waiting for the other service to come. So you may be looking at, okay, let me do an event-based, right? So based on services being available, uh, it comes up and then it processes and, and it hands over to the next service, right? So when you think of those things, you're looking at all those, um, you know, plumbing code that you need to write in your code. For example, if you are connecting to a messaging service, you need to write those plumbing code, right? Um, so Dapper comes in a, in, a, in a place where it comes, it takes up all these things and puts it something like a sidecar. So it uses a sidecar pattern. Uh, so which means it takes all these, uh, you know, networking infrastructure and other other related stuff and, and puts it into a sidecar. So where you're not, you're only trying to writing the configurations and between your code, you're writing as if, you're writing uh, calling another DLL or another service that is uh, where you know it exists, but it may be existing on somewhere else. You may be connecting to probably Azure Service Bus. You may be connecting to a Redis. Uh, you may be connecting to um, uh, something else, Kafka. 
I don't know. I mean, so those things all comes in as a pluggable model. So you can make use of Dapper uh, for achieving those things. So that way you're not really worried about writing those infrastructure and other related codes. Uh, basically the code that actually, you know, uh, kind of is necessary for you to connect to another service or anything else, but it is not something which you want to be focused on as a business. So those things get, um, uh, you know, taken out and goes into the sidecar, right? So, so you have availability like that on uh, with the Dapper. So that's what I was talking about in terms of infrastructure. You're not worried about the, those infrastructure aspects. Um, and you don't particularly learn a programming model. For example, if you look at other serverless offerings, you, you technically have to understand how these serverless are programmed and you your, your business logic kind of tends towards writing it in, in that pattern. But here with Azure Container Apps, it's your code. You As long as it has a Docker file and it is an image, uh, you can actually deploy to uh, Azure Container App. So that means it is your own programming model. You, you can have a Node.js app, Python app, .NET app. They're all, they can all work with uh, each other in a single infrastructure or in multiple uh, as well, right? So you have those kind of advantages as well. And also uh, the important aspect of serverless is to scale on demand and also scale to zero. And the way we achieve that is using something called a SCADA. Uh, which is Kubernetes even driven and auto scaling. Uh, it's a it's it's a technology by which you again you know they are all they are scale triggers. So you specify if my CPU usage is at certain level, then you want to scale up or scale down or whatever, right? Or if my memory utilization is so much, then then scale uh, another VM or something like that, right? So you can define those things as a scale. It's it's very declarative, so it 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 remains true to what you define there. Um, so important aspect is you can scale down to zero, which means when you uh, you may have something called as a worker service, which is like it's a background service. It doesn't have HTTP endpoints. It's just running behind the scenes, and it is looking at something outside. For example, it is looking at a storage queue, and if there is something in the storage queue, it needs to come up, do its task, and then go back to zero mode if you want to. So that way, you can actually uh, save uh, some cost uh, in terms of not running the applications um, when you don't need them, right? So you have these kind of advantages uh, when you go with uh, ACA. Now, important question that comes up is like, when, what can you build with Azure Container Apps? Azure Container Apps is very focused in terms of, uh, very opinionated in terms of microservices building. So if you are someone who building microservices uh, and doesn't need the complexity of Kubernetes, then ACA by default is the choice that you need to go because you have, you have the service to service communication uh, with the help of Damper. You also have the advantage of using revision management, uh, which is you can have, um, like multiple versions of your app uh, when you want to do let's say blue green or uh, you know a b testings and things like that you can also uh, you know very easily achieve that using so simple revision management like for example in this case you can see that http traffic it can go to 80 percent on one revision and 20 percent uh, on other revisions and things like that and um, web apps simple web apps that you're trying to host um, you know, uh, that's that's great for uh, using container apps because it comes with all those uh, custom domains, TLS certifications, and uh, integrated authentication and things like that. And uh, event-driven processing, I, I spoke about this, like if you are working with queues and things like that, um, you know, um, ACA is a great um, uh, service that you can look at. And also background processing. So uh, we have something called as .NET Podcast, a sample that I will be showing up a little later which covers all of most of these scenarios that we talk about. And that's the kind of scenarios where if you're thinking about microservices development, uh, it's our, those are really useful in those, uh, in those cases, right? Uh, so we're gonna look at the end-to-end -end -to -end demo, which is the .NET Podcast app. Uh, but before we go to the .NET Podcast app, I'll show you a very simple way how to get started with ACA which is Azure Container Apps. Uh, and then .NET Podcast is basically the end-to-end -end demo. So it's nothing but it's just a podcast app, but it's open source. You can go and ch check the code on how it is implemented. It has Listen Together and other uh, things in there. Uh, and importantly, uh, let me let me show you quickly on the architecture it has. For example, it has a Maui app, a Blazor Wasm app. Uh, so this is immaterial. We're not talking about any client apps today. But on the on your right, you can see that there is Azure Container Apps, which has the API. So we have a podcast API where um, you know, all these client apps is going to query to understand what are the podcasts available, who subscribe to what, uh, all this information is out here. We also have an endpoint where people can submit podcasts. So they can submit a new podcast and, 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 and then if it is a valid podcast, then that will show up on every user's, um, uh, you know, app. 
to do that, what we do is instead of taking the podcast API and immediately doing the logic to find out whether it's a valid podcast or not, what we do is we ignore that and we directly put them into the Azure Storage queue. And then there is a podcast ingestion service, which is a background service, which is actually uh, configured in container apps as a, with a scale, scale set rule, where it looks at the storage queue and tries to uh, see if there is anything in the queue that needs to be processed. It just wakes up and then it just processes and goes back uh, to zero row, right? So, so you have that option of like you know looking at and scaling depending on what is available. Um, so that way you can see how these are all working together within the single environment like podcast and uh, like the API, which has the endpoint for the external traffic and ingestion and data. They are all worker services. They don't need an endpoint, so they work uh, within the same environment, but as a background services. Right? So I'm not going to go into the details of the rest of the things, but I'll briefly touch upon that when I will explain this in the uh, in the in the uh, in the demo. Now, but let's get started with let's get started with um, how do you get started with Azure Container Apps, right? So before that, let's say if I want to go and deploy this, you can go to the Docs Container Apps, and you can see that this is the doc that is available to get you started. So you start with an Azure CLI, you install that. You can also run it on Azure PowerShell. Um, AZ login, so you log in with your Azure credential. And then the very next thing that you want to do is you want to add this extension called Container App because everything that you want to do with Container App will, will depend on this extension. So you do AZ extension name and then um, Container App and, and add them. And once you do that, there's one more thing that you need to do on your Azure subscription is to register the Microsoft.app namespace. So that's where the Container App sits. Um, so you need to register that namespaces and also operational insights because it uses log analytics. Um, and then you provide some environmental variable like uh, yeah, you, what is the resource group that you're working on, uh, what is the location that you want to install, and then uh, what is the environment name. Container app environment is something more like a, like an environment in which all your container apps are going to reside. Within the same environment, the two container apps can talk to each other and they, they have the same networking infrastructure. Uh, but you it's up to you. You can decide whether you want to have all the apps together in one environment or in a separate environment, depending on your business. right? Um, and then you go ahead and create a resource group. Basically, these are the um, environmental variables that we, we created earlier, and we're just going and creating the resource group. And then if you go and say uh, you want to create an environment, so that's the starting point, and you provide the location. Once you create the environment, you go ahead and create uh, the Azure Container App, right? So AZ Container App, provide those uh, input values. So your image may be different from this. So if you are, uh, if you want your app to have an ingress, that means you want an endpoint, uh, you can specify this here. Uh, and you, can, you should also specify the port. So if it's a HTTP endpoint, you probably are listening to on 80. Uh, and then the ingress, you can decide between whether you want an internal uh, ingress or an external ingress. So based on that, uh, you will have um, the, the FKDN uh, that is enabled for you. So you can access that domain uh, automatically from outside if you say external, right? So this is a simple thing, but we're not going to do any of these things. And I'll show you how I can achieve the same thing without doing any of these things. So right now, I have a, a Node.js application here. Uh, just for the simplicity's sake, I'm just going to use Node, but we're going to look at .NET as well in a bit. So I'm going to open that in VS Code. Now, so you can see that it's a simple Node.js application. It has a .app.js file. Um, and what I want to show you is it has something called as album controller.js. So it is looking at the, so if you do slash albums, it is going to pick up the album.js. It's all nothing but a simple data. Think of it like something comes from the database, and it is going to drop it into the um, uh, into the uh, user's uh, endpoint, right? So, for example, uh, if, the, if this is an endpoint, and then then when you query the album, it just dumps in this data uh, as in, in the response stream. It's a very simple one. All that I have here is just the Docker file, which tells that okay, this is a Node.js application, and it exposes endpoint like three thousand five hundred. So this is what it needs to uh, listen on, right? So that's all it has, right? So once you have that much in your code, I can now go here and type in Azure Container App. Let's uh, see if this is, OK. So let's use help here. So I can show you some of the commands that's available here. There you go. So I have Azure Container App. Um, I can do auth if I want dapper related ones. If I want to do ingress, I have ingress related commands. And in what I want to do is something called as op command. This is similar to the Docker Compose app and things like that. That you you basically want to bring this up into uh, 
um, uh, deploy it and then bring that uh, services up, right? So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to use AZ Container App. Just going to look at the questions. If there's any. Okay, a few. Cool. Uh, oh, yeah. So Nilesh says Nish has some RGB lights. Yes, that's happening there. Uh, it's fun to have some RGB lights in your office. Okay, so let's um, let's do that. Easy container app. So the way I do that is easy container app, and then I use the up command. I'm just trying to see what's the best way to display this, so that I can uh, come on. Um, yeah, so this is uh, easy container. If I correctly write it, type it. Container app up command. And then I provide a name. So in this case, I'll just say uh, happy hours. Okay. That's my name. And then I want to say that, hey, I want to build up the uh, deploy this based on the source code here. So I just provide my source is right here. So I just say hyphen hyphen source and then dot. So that's the current directory. And that's it. I'm just going to hit return key. And you can see that it, it automatically looked at the Docker file and said, oh, there's a port 3,500. So that's what it needs to uh, uh, you know, expose. And then you can see that it was actually, it, it went ahead and used my existing podcast RG resource group, which is where the .NET podcast is what I've installed it. And I have a very uh, good reason to tell you why I'm using that, but in a bit. Um, so you can see that it is also using the reusing the existing environment that is already there in this resource group. It's going ahead and building the Docker um, uh, image, and it's not building here. It is uh, my Docker. There's no Docker running on my desktop right now, so it's actually building uh, right inside the container registry, and then and then it is going to be pushed into the um, container registry as well. So you can see that it is going ahead, going ahead and pulling the few things. It's actually created the ACR for me, and it has put in something called as happy hours, tagged itself into something, some random random number. And then you can see that you know it just went ahead and uh, trying to push um, into the ACR, which is all done. Now it's trying to make a run. So that means it did all these things by itself. So I can I can promise you all that I did is AZ login uh, and AZ container app registration. Uh, oh, sorry, adding that extension, and that's it. Just pointed to my code and then did AZ container app up. And the reason I did not explain anything else in that Node.js app is because I do not know much about Node.js, but I just took, to, took it as a sample and I wanted to execute it and see how fast can I get to uh, code to cloud. There you go. So it's pretty was pretty easy for me to just get there. Now, as soon as it is done, you can see that there's an URL also uh, enabled for you. So that means because ingress is true on that. So if I click on this, so right now it's on my uh, this uh, desktop here. OK, there you go. So hip, happy hyphen hours. And then it just created some random name. It says it doesn't have albums. So we'll give albums an endpoint. And there you go. So that's it. So within no time, I was able to take my code and then deploy to cloud. And uh, you can see that I, it's, it's actually running on Kubernetes. And there's none of the Kubernetes things that we brought in here. There's no Helm charts. There's no deployment YAMLs. There's none of that, right? And all that is, or if you go into this, uh, into the podcast RG. And the reason why I want to tell you this here is this is my existing infrastructure where my .NET podcast app is running. For example, if I go into podcast web here, right here, uh, let's go into the URL and it exposes, which I don't remember right now. And I'm expecting the portal to tell me in a bit. There you go. So if I open this, and while that's happening, I can go back to the addresses group. So there you go. So this is a .NET podcast app. And if I click on sign in, it is actually going in. This is the uh, you know Blazor hybrid app, which is running inside the browser. It's a Blazor Wasm. So I can go and listen to my podcast. So this is all running in Azure in podcast RG. So this is my container apps environment. And you can see that. Uh, so if you go, this is the end.podcast environment. That's where it went and deployed. This is completely .NET apps. So all of them, what you see here, they're all .NET apps. So it has a web app, there's an ACA. But within the same environment, I went ahead and installed a Node.js app itself. All right, so I'm going to refresh this. Uh, let's go search for happy hours. There you go. So they right here. So this is the happy hours app. Now you can see that this is nothing but a container apps. Uh, app. So if I go into scale, 
I can also specify the scale for this right here. So I can see, so you can see that minimum replica is zero to 30. It's all by default, so I can edit and I can create a new version if I want to, and I can provide those uh, details, like what is my scale and other things, or I can provide it in, in the CI CD pipeline, but which is uh, which is the right way to do it. Uh, but I just want to show you that you know it's all possible here. So if you go to containers, let's see what's in the containers. So you can see the container registry from which the uh, the app was pulled in. Uh, it's using the Linux and one variables, help props. If I have defined it, it would be here. Um, so you have all of that right inside here, right? You can go into Dapper. If I want to enable Dapper, I can also enable Dapper from right here, okay? So it's pretty simple. So they all are, again, if you look at this one right here, Podcast ACA, API, Podcast API CA. So now this one, if you look at, this is all happening. Uh, this is a .NET app, and you can see that it has the same uh, level of configurations that is there here. So if I go to the scale over here, let's see if the for oh, the scale is again zero to thirty. So those are all default. Let me see if I have a scale that is configured for ingestion, which I think I have. And if I go to a data CA and scale, let's see, not sure. No, I don't think this is either. All right, let's. Uh, that's fine. I'm just trying to see if there's anything else. Okay, there's no ingestion service here. That's not deployed here. That's the reason why it does, doesn't have there. Cool, no worries. So what I'm gonna show you is, let me show you now an end-to-end -end, uh, way of deploying uh, this from Visual Studio for .NET Apps because you have all these things that I showed you in CLI all baked into Visual Studio itself and we'll see an end-to-end -end how to do that. So let me go ahead and play a video because I recorded this in advance because with ACA and generally anything to do with cloud, you need to wait for a long time for its deployment to succeed and, and, and to demo that it's even harder. So what I did is I went ahead and pre-recorded this demo. So I'm gonna play that for you right now and then we'll come back to questions for you, from you. Podcast API backend in Visual Studio. Create a new project, choose ASP.NET Core Web API, provide a name and make sure to check the Docker support in it and then click create and this will give a default web api project and because it has docker file in it the visual studio detects that docker was not running so it goes ahead and starts docker desktop take a bit of time but then it just goes and builds the images and then now we're ready to go the project by default gives me a weather forecast endpoint so i'm going to change that to something like categories which may be relevant to the podcast api i'm going to leave the implementation as is because so I'm just going to create as a sample, but I also going to create another endpoint, which is called shows, and I can just remove those weather forecast implementation there, and I'm just simply going to return a string. Uh, probably I'm going to write return all episodes, or, or maybe, maybe I can just type return shows, which is great. Now I have two endpoints. I'm going to change the name as well, and I'm going to run this in Docker. When I do run you can see that i have a by default i get the swagger endpoint so i have categories and shows right there i can expand it and execute and you can see the response has shows in it now let's go and publish this in azure so if you right click and publish you get this menu and you can choose azure here you can also choose docker container registry if you're just simply creating an image now here i'm going to choose azure container apps you see preview but it's, it's now ga but i'm going to choose that and click next now, this one gives me uh, to select container apps. I'm going to create a new one. I'm going to create a name. It creates environment. It provides resource groups and other things. Make sure you select the right ones and then click create. Now, this will go ahead and create the environment for me. The one more step over here is to create the registry as well so that you want to keep it in a secure registry, the images that you create. So I'll just choose mine, which is already there, which is the niche demos. So I'll go ahead and click finish. And now you can see it already created and endpoint for me ingress with including HTTPS there. And that comes free for it Azure Container Apps, right? I can go and choose Swagger to see, all right, there's nothing there. Now I need to publish because that's when my image is gonna be picked up by Container Apps, right? So I do that and now let's go see what's the response. Now if I go do Swagger, I should be getting the same thing that we saw earlier, that's it. Categories and shows right there. So far, this source code is on my local, so I can go ahead and add to my source control. I'm going to choose GitHub. You can choose Azure DevOps if you want to, but I'll add in GitHub credentials here so that I can publish this repository into my GitHub. 
So I'm going to enter my details there and also change a few things like uh, let's go ahead and change the name, repository name to broadcast hyphen API instead of dot. And I'll leave that to be a private repository for now, but you can go ahead and change it if you want to. Create and push. So this will take care of taking my uh, source code and publishing it there. Now if I do a publish again, it asks me for registry. That's okay because I have it. Now look at this, it has CI CD option as well. So instead of publishing directly to Azure, I can choose this option. What it is gonna do, it's, it's gonna create a CI CD pipeline as well for me. And this is all Visual Studio doing all the amazing things that it can do, right? So now it says, whatever you go change, and then if it's push, then it is going to go and deploy as well. So just to see this working, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the endpoint, or I'm gonna add the endpoint, we call this as episodes, and then simply let's call it as uh, episodes, let me type it right, that's it. And then commit the changes as always. Now, if I say commit all, and then the next step is syncing. So I'll go ahead and sync this repository. So now my local and my, re my remote is synced. So I'll go back to check. So I'll log into my GitHub. And in this case, just directly go into my repositories. Uh, forgot the name that I gave, so I'll go to the repositories and then search for it. I think, yeah, it's that Spotcast API test. So I'm gonna click on that. And there you go, you can see that, you know, it's already running. So that means the workflow is all set up for me. And this is all done by Visual Studio. I did not even uh, type all these things in, right? So you can go and change it if you want to. Uh, so there's also a code there. So there you go, it's built and deployed to container registry. And then it is gonna pull into container apps as well. So if I refresh, there you go. So. Now I have the new endpoint set up. So you can see how CICD entire pipeline is also set up for me. Now let's take a look at .NET Podcast app, which you can find on github.com slash Microsoft .NET hyphen podcast. Now this is a simple podcast app, which has a .NET MAUI front end, which connects iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac, and also has scalable backend, which includes Azure container apps. If you look at the architecture of .NET Podcast, it has the .NET MAUI frontend, which means it has iOS, Android, Mac OS, and Windows application. It also has a hybrid app baked into it, which uses Blazor. That's the Listen Together one. We'll see that in a bit. Now, if you look at the backend, it has Azure App Services. Now, this is great. It has a couple of things, Podcast API, Podcast Ingestion, Podcast Worker. Well, Podcast API is just nothing but the web API endpoint, which we saw earlier and podcast ingestion and worker they're all background services they are running behind the scenes uh, to particularly looking at some functionality so in this case let's take an example like if someone wants to submit a podcast they can access the podcast api and submit the podcast uh, with certain information but now all the podcast that is submitted shouldn't be going into a database so what we do is we send it to an azure storage account where it's into the feed queue and their podcast ingestion service is actually going to look at it and it is going to process them and if it is relevant to this .NET podcast it is going to pick that up and then send it to the sql server database now there's also log analytics workspace that all comes within the azure container apps we also have signal r for show, uh, doing listen together which is really amazing that is when you want to share a particular podcast with somebody else and then want to react and respond uh, to certain things that are spoken there. We use SignalR and show you how to do that, including the place of WASM there. Finally, this is a great architecture to see how to build a simple podcast app. If you open this podcast app in Visual Studio, you'll see a Docker Compose file, which is a great way to run multiple uh, applications within the containers locally. Now you can send some environment variables here, but that's all, I'm not going to get into the details of these, but let's look at how to run this, right? So if you go to Docker Compose, you can run it, but I want to show you this Docker Compose launch settings where you can choose which ones you really want to debug and the other ones you can just simply say you do not want to debug so that that way you're only working with the services that you absolutely need to debug. Now I'll go ahead and run this all together. So it's going to boot up everything. It's going to build all the images and there you go. So now I have the podcast API endpoint, which is with all the feeds and other things where you can submit a new podcast or you can also query for podcasts, which is already in there in the database. I can also go to 5001, which is a listen together hub. It's a signal R service. And I have 5002, which is the podcast website. And now this is a web page. And if you click sign in, now this is a Blazor 
uh, app if you go in i can you can see that the ones that i have subscribed to and i can start playing you may not be able to listen to the music i'm able to hear here uh, i can modify a few things like increasing the speed and things like that it's accessing these apis uh, for uh, running the uh, soundtrack uh, onto the audio channels right so now if i go to the listen together mode this is very very exciting for me if you see i can create a new room so that i can invite others to join so here i'm going to give my name as nish and start opening the room so now i have the invite code or the copy code now i can send this to somebody else uh, now because while recording this i don't have another person here so i'm going to use a new private window and open the same url and now i'm a new person here and if i go to the listen together mode i can join the room using the code that was created there so if you'd see that's the code that we created if i copy paste that and say join the room now i can give matt as another user here i'm just going to show you an example so i'm going to go side by side you can see the dark theme and the the bright theme and if i play here you can see on the right that also plays and i can also send my reaction so for certain things that's being spoken there so that way you can see how two apps are connected and it is able to uh, react and respond to things this this is all the magic of signal r and if you are excited about uh, doing this something like a chat app you can go ahead and take a look at the source code and implement something for yourself now what i did not show you today is executing the dotnet maui app which you can also try it for yourself if you go into that podcast app there is a folder where you can execute the maui uh, apps. You can make sure that you have Maui workloads so that you can run this locally. You can also debug them locally or connect to the remote services. Uh, they are all going to work great. Just go to the .NET Podcast um, GitHub repository and it has all the instructions to get you started. What I love about this architecture is that we are using Azure Container Apps as the mobile backend. The good thing about that is it obviously supports the auto scalability feature, which is what we are going to look at it right now. And um, the other thing is it can scale down to zero, which means you can save some cost too. So this is all done using um, uh, using Keda. Uh, so we're not going to go into the details of it, but I'm going to show you in .NET Podcast how we managed to uh, use this feature. Remember I told you there's a feed queue where every podcast that has been submitted goes in. And let's see how that podcast uh, ingestion service scaled. Now, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the ARM template where we write the details of podcast um, container apps. Within the container apps configuration, we kind of like provide the details of we need an ingress, uh, which that means we need to expose it externally. And then we have a few things that we can set it up here, which is one of the things is the scalability factor, which I was talking to you about. So right now there's a min replica is one, max replica is five. That means based on the scalable rule that we set here, in this case, HTTP scaling, that means if you have 20 concurrent requests or more, then uh, container apps is gonna scale your apps automatically. And the good thing is if you set min replica to zero, you can also scale down to zero when there is absolutely no traffic as well. If you look at the ingestion service, we set the min replica to be zero and the max, max replicas to be five, which makes sense for this service. If you look at the scalability rule here, we are looking at the feed queue, which is the storage queue, which I was talking about. So if we have really a lot of feed queue, uh, sorry, queues of podcasts coming in, and that's when we want to scale. So depending on the queue length, we scale to maximum of five replicas, and that is going to go ahead and process those uh, new podcasts that is coming in and ingest into the database. To see this in action, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create uh, a simple script that is going to send in a lot of uh, new podcasts into the service. So here we go. So I have something called a simulate hyphen feed hyphen request dot PS1. And I'm hitting those URLs, which is nothing but the podcast API web point. And on the top left, you can see the message count going up to 57, 50. And on the right and left, those are the replicas. One is the web API on the top and the bottom is the worker. And now I'm again hitting more so that, you know, we can see the scalability and you can see that on the top, uh, based on the web scaling rule, there are two replicas now. And in the bottom, there is this worker, which is now increased to three replicas. Now that is so cool that it automatically is able to do that. Now, if you look at the workers, uh, you know, look at the handler part of it, all that it is doing here is basically, uh, this worker is going to be initiated. This is a fairly simple one. All that it is doing is looking for the .NET keyword in its title and accepting it. So based on certain configurations, we were able to scale up 
as and when there is demand. All right, now let's go look at the uh, portal on how this has been configured. So see, these are the things that gets defaultly configured. And if I go into the podcast API CA, which is container apps, and if I wait for a little bit of say time, you'll see the URLs and things like that come up there. So that's the URL which it's being hosting the API. Now, if I go to the Dapper, if I have to enable Dapper, I can go ahead and do that. Uh, but for this demo, I am not using Dapper, so I have, I have disabled it. Uh, I can go into the containers or scale, for example, and see what is the configuration. So if I have to do this in portal, I can also go ahead and do that. But I think it's better to do it in the uh, in your ARM templates and uh, CICD takes care of everything that way, right? Cool, this is the ingress where the external traffic has been enabled or disabled. It's a pretty cool demo, so I hope you liked it. All right, all right. So that's it. Uh, we wake from me on container apps. I hope uh, you all enjoy the demo. And uh, it's just super hard work to kind of like record them and wait for it, and then edit it out all the time gaps, and and then and then put some voiceovers to it. Definitely, I, th I think uh, you know it's very difficult to record. I know that. You know, <laughs> we know. <laughs> As developer advocates, we know how difficult it is to record a demo like this. Um, right. So, uh, Nish, there are a couple of questions. Uh, there are questions in the uh, from online audience as well, and there are questions in the uh, you know uh, from the audience here as well. So, okay. first we will answer the online audience questions. So, Nish, you have the control anyways, so you can pick the questions from online and uh, whichever you want to address and. And see yeah, I'll pick the easy it. one. It's, I'll pick some easy ones. Will the recording will be available? Yes, the recording is available on the same link right now on YouTube. And uh, there's a question on this. Uh, what are some subtasks within domain of monitoring if that is applicable in microservice app? Um, in a microservice app, I mean, generally in monitoring, there is like multiple things. Like one is yeah, obviously logs. You, you want to do some structured logging, which means you can query the logs easily. Uh, you want to enable distributed trace tracing, which means you need to provide correlation IDs between the services so that you know it connects to all. The, whenever you look at the log, you know that you know there's an entire trace available for you to understand from which point it started and how it trans uh, transmitted through other services and what was exact exceptions and errors and things like that. Right. Um, so there are a few other things like that which I don't recall right now, but um, yeah, there uh, any anything that comes under the monitoring and instrumentation side of things, uh, you probably want to take a look at that one. Uh, what else? Um, <clears throat> well, and okay, there's a question on, most of the time SignalR loses connection when app goes background, how do we ensure? Uh, yeah, so SignalR depends on the WebRTC. So whatever um, things like uh, drawbacks there would apply there as well. Uh, I mean, the way we can work around with this is like combine this with push notifications, like for the platform which you're building apps to, um, and then uh, you will be able to notify the user when there is some messages. So just like every chat app nowadays that does it, like it is, it waits for a few day, few time when people are not responded it, then then sends a push notification about the uh, depending on the sensitivity uh, to of the messages in the configuration that the user has configured for notification settings. So you can decide to send a push notification instead. Um, I don't see anything else, which is, uh, I see, I've turn all text in program into Chinese or Japanese language. Uh, yeah, feel free to, I mean, if you were talking about the uh, demo app, feel free to send us a PR. And I don't know who's going to verify this, but uh, probably one way to maintain is like maintain a version of it, and then we probably can uh, send links to that. Yeah, so there are questions uh, from the audience here uh, in person as well. Sure. So, can yeah. Question relates to the Sri Lanka like monitor used for the Dapper uh, setting up the Latina app. So, for example, if I deploy with some name and is there a question to upgrade when I change the code? For example, maybe I change whatever files are out, and then I do the same thing up. Like I use the up command, but again upgrade client with it. Or if I use the same name, does it okay. automatically the new image? Or yeah, so I'm trying to simplify the question to you, Nish. So, the question is uh, the CLI which you used uh, for you know, uh, deploying this container apps. So he wants to see if there is a code change which you make and is there an easier way to just uh, upgrade it? Uh, is there just I can, you know, 
type in some up, up command or upgrade command or something like that is there any command such uh, in uh, container apps yeah. where i can so, update the code so same command will work but the, there's also another way to do that is use the ci cd all right the way which i did it like set up the ci cd for it and then so it just becomes easy from cli itself you didn't even have to have source code locally you have this option called hyphen hyphen repository and then you can config tell that uh, url for that repository and i think it opens up a browser and allows you to authenticate to kind of like get you the credential to do the github and then it will do the ci cd for you for that repo as well so that's also one way to look at it i mean that would be the easiest way i would say like then after that it just once it is set up it's just about you changing the code and then committing the changes and then seeing it going live did i answer your question yep okay cool so yeah one more question Yeah, so I'll take this question, uh, Nish. So basically, this question is the about... question for the on, for the online audience oh, yeah. because so the question is, hear anything. The question is around the startup and how to bring that startup onto the uh, Microsoft program, and he needs help in 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 doing that. So uh, we will discuss that after the session, uh, after all the sessions. Yeah. Sure, definitely. We we can discuss that after the session. True, true, true. Definitely, we can we can have a discussion after the session on that. So I think uh, Nish, uh, we are done with the questions. So we still have the question here. Just one second. We still have the question. Okay. Yeah. So there is a question on, can we use Azure co Cognitive Services with the uh, container apps? I, I think you can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, I, I think there's nothing stopping you from using any service, uh, regardless of whether it's Azure or outside, as long as they are reachable uh, yeah. from your service where you're deploying it, it should be good. So you could use it with SDKs or as APIs and containerize it. And even Cognitive Services nowadays support containers. As well, so you can you can do that. Uh, yeah, one more last question. <laughs> yeah, I want to know like if I want to set up an app that you are using as your religion, how much time will it take? Is it like or do I have to do it? Is it better? Is it like possible to do it? So the question is, Nesh, um, how to build um, Uber kind of an application, uh, and how much time does it take to build such an application? into the uh, system so that that's a very relative uh, question so we can obviously discuss after this session uh, we both can uh, have discussions uh, on the same after this session on what exactly you're looking for because you know it takes ages to build such apps right so it is built on various things at the back end <laughs> Yeah, yeah, quickly, I'll just tell you, I mean, uh, I'm not going to talk about the architectural stuffs, but I think uh, that's where you want to look at something like a serverless offerings, where you do not want to waste time uh, looking at infrastructure and other aspects and, and build those learning curves. Instead, you look at these options where you are m more quickly to get your POCs or proof of concepts that you're building uh, to the cloud, and then you you take the advantage of those uh, you know, scalability and other aspects, which is why you would come to cloud, the security, scalability, resiliency, you know, performance efficiency, and all those things. Uh, so make sure you use these kind of things so you can give faster than the regular way of doing things. <clears throat> Got it. Yeah, last question. Yeah, we can do that. I'll tell you how to do it after the session as well, because it's 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 not relevant to the container apps, but it is more of building that uh, that whole pipeline 
and deploying that pipeline as an API and using that API into your containers will work, right? So we'll obviously uh, discuss that, those things, uh, once we are done with the sessions. Uh, I'll be here. We can obviously have a you know one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. meetings on that. Okay, thank you, Nish. Uh, I think we'll just move forward to the next uh, set of sessions. I think we have a bunch of things to cover today. And uh, thanks, thanks again, Nish. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for great questions and being for being a great audience. I'll see you later, next time. Bye. So yeah, we are moving on. So uh, basically, so I'm going to take the second session on the serverless part of it. So how many of you are familiar with Azure functions? You have done it, you're, you're done first set of functions before you built it, great. And uh, we have a couple of them who are new as well. And there are people in the online as well who will be new. So we're going to talk about uh, what is uh, functions or a serverless as well. Uh, that's the major thing. And then we're going to see some demos and other things and some use cases as well. I will end the session with use cases so that you can go back and uh, build something out of this, right? And before that, I just want to introduce myself. Um, I've been saying hi, hello, welcome to my show and other stuff. But yeah, I'm Vivek. Um, I started my career as a software developer at IBM. Uh, did a couple of things from a DevOps perspective, and uh, I was I was also the uh, co-founder of Nudo Next Technology. And uh, after that, uh, I was very much interested in communities, working with developers, working with startups, and other things. So joined DigitalOcean mm -hmm. as a developer advocate. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is my second role at Microsoft. Uh, my first role is um, in is being part of the strategy and investment role. And the second role is in the cloud and AI engineering, back to engineering, by the way, if I have to call it. So uh, that's me. And if you want to get connected with me, uh, these are my digital coordinates. Uh, whenever you want something, you want to uh, learn something new, uh, just connect with me uh, from, a, uh, from a connection perspective. So let's just start with the history. Um, so what I'm talking here is it's about history. So uh you can you can guess my age uh because i'm part of that era where we were doing everything on on premises right uh, we had server rooms we were wearing jackets uh, nowadays we nobody wears jacket uh, while you're working on computers but we used to wear jackets even when it was like summer we were wearing jackets and going into uh, some of the server rooms and sitting in those rooms and working on those big machines uh, which were there, right? So, um, so I'm I'm basically from the on-premises, you know, era, and obviously uh, the digital transformation took place. There were a couple of companies we started moving towards solving the problem of going into the rooms instead, you know, moving out of those rooms and uh, managing those machines and everything through a different uh, set of tools, and uh, that is where. Uh, the infrastructure as a service came in. Obviously, it was uh, it was built on the security part of it, right? And then uh, you know managing the OS and uh, other tools uh, became very important, and that's that's how uh, PaaS came into picture. Like for example, managing a database was so difficult uh, from an on-premises perspective, right? So it all moved to a PaaS. It was easy. To manage there, but still there were challenges, and how how uh, how we solve these challenges, moving the business logic into serverless, right? Moving everything on onto the uh, onto the uh, onto the cloud providers, and uh, you are just focused on business logic which you have. So that is what serverless is all about. So that's basic. And I'll also talk about, you know, as, as I talked about history, there were problems, right, before cloud. Uh, if you see this, there are a bunch of questions, you know, when, you know, we need to procure machines. We don't know who is going to monitor connections. 
and power issues we need to make sure power power is up and running backups have been taken patches have been done all of these things were there before cloud and when digital transformation happened when we moved into again infrastructure as a service there are a bunch of questions still remained but it solved some problems for us right so if you see you know there is again backup problems and and patching problems and choosing an os is a problem and size of the machines and uh, how do we scale is app is again a problem right you know it's basically it's not easy and even in infrastructure as a service uh, you just need to have load balancers have different machines on top of that and all those things and then came the era of uh, pass uh, which is which is again the questions number of questions reduced here right if you see this slide the questions reduced but still there were questions the patching system or the uh, size of the machines you're going to run on and uh, and on obviously uh, scaling your app uh, is also was a challenge uh, when this happened and then came the serverless where you're just focused on building app you don't care about how this scales uh, you are not worried about security part of it maintainability everything right so that is what uh, serverless is all about and uh, so what is serverless so a couple of things it abstracts the infrastructure for the developer it's basically abstracting the whole thing for the developer developer is only focused on his business logic rest is everything is managed by the cloud provider when i say rest is everything it's the infrastructure so when i say infrastructure what it is it's reliability security scalability everything is uh, and availability as well everything is managed by the uh, cloud provider and wherever you are hosting these things and most importantly all of these things are event driven there is a event which is happening then it gets triggered so what does that mean that means it's very simple you are only paying pay per use right it's very simple example if i have to give you we all use uh, the uh, upi transactions right so you know i don't think so anybody is doing a upi transaction at 1 am 2 am like it's was it's very minimal so we don't need to have an infrastructure for that right if you have these transactions which is happening on serverless running on serverless the cost would be drastically reduced because there is a a time period within your application where nobody is going to use our azure service while i was in blackbook none of the orders used to come after 7 am because all lorries and other things used to you know start working after and before 7 am like they used to start at 3 am uh, the logging and everything and after 7 am there is much not much traffic into your application and then again some up some traffic which is going to come in and then again there is a little bit of traffic which is coming in the evening there's a bunch of traffic which comes in the evening so there is a time period within your application where there is no need of infrastructure at all you just need only on a need basis so that is where you know uh, serverless is an amazing uh, you know uh, an amazing uh, service and it's a concept to use right where you have a minimal use of it and you have an event basically somebody is doing a upi transaction somebody is booking a car somebody is booking a lorry so there is an event which is happening and then it gets triggered so unless and until somebody is not doing it you don't have to pay for the infrastructure right so that is that is the main purpose of it and that is what serverless is and there are a bunch of benefits to it obviously you will only focus on building it and you are not really focusing on managing the infrastructure we all know right i come from devops background when you see managing the infrastructure scaling the infrastructure making sure it is available it's all you know time consuming and very difficult and in your know, large scale scenarios it's much much harder and obviously efficiency right you you are focused on getting your app into uh, the market and also you uh, build quality in your production right so there is all the availability maintainability security everything is and performance everything is built into the system so you are only just writing app and deploying this app so that is where uh, the efficiency also comes in and the flexibility when i talk about flexibility it's more important here the you can code in different different languages 
the serverless supports different languages. There's a Java support, there's a Python support, there's a Node.js, there's a .NET. So your team can be diverse and you, you can build systems uh, around the best solution, right? Say, for example, you know, Java might be very good for solving certain problem and .NET might be the good option for building certain problems, right? So you're going to use both of these uh, in a code basis in your application. Uh, that is where the flexibility comes in. And this is a very good fit for microservices. And did I mean Nish did talk about the monolithic and the microservice. And this is an amazing uh, tool for uh, building uh, microservices, right? You can have a bunch of services doing one specific job and solving the problem. And you connect all of these things to an app and you're using this as part of an app, right? So that's a simple way to build it. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so functions as a service was came into the picture and functions as a service is nothing but a programming model. So it's basically a framework. It's kind of a platform built and it's a framework built on how to build this service. As a developer, how you can focus on um, business logic and deploy it as a function, right? Function is what? You, you, if you come from background of coding, right? So function is nothing but a single piece of code. It just do a single job, right? You write functions, different functions to solve one single piece of things. So that is why it is named as functions. So basically this does only one single uh, specific job. And whenever that gets triggered, it runs and executes and it provides the data or pushes the data into different uh, services. And it just closes its, uh, its execution. So that's what, it, what I mean by single responsibility there. And what is short lived? So basically, this is, as I told you, right, it's just short lived, right? It is basically running in the background. An event happens, it runs in the background, closes the section, closes the event, right? <coughs> that is what, <coughs> excuse me. So there is, it's also stateless. Basically, you don't attach a state to this. Basically, you are going to run it as, as per the execution. So there is no state to it. There is no data associated to it. It is just a, a, a application running. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm having a bad. <coughs> okay. So there is a state and then, <coughs> I don't know, something wrong. <coughs> And then there is a uh, event based again. This is again an event based. So obviously it is scalable. Since there is no data attached to it, uh, it is obviously scalable. It can you can replicate it. So if you attach a data to it, you can't replicate. If it is no data attached, you can just use it as a single point. You can still build stateless with durable functions, right? And that is also available. Uh, it's it's called as durable functions. I'm not going to talk about it much because of the time, but we will uh, obviously can discuss what are those things. If you have a specific questions, we can have a discussion on that. So, so fu functions is very simple. Uh, it is a programming model. As I told you, it is a structure, how you can uh, build a function and you can deploy a function. And there are a couple of built-in things which is available, which is triggers and bindings. Uh, bindings are obviously, uh, it can, you can bind input and you can bind outputs. So that is one thing, but there is triggers. You need to have different triggers are there. It could be, it could be a, the event can be executed with HTTP trigger, or it can be executed with data getting into a blob storage something happens on a storage and it gets triggered and or it can be through a cosmos db where database is there and something happens on the storage and it executes right so that is also be done and obviously as i told you it's about developer experience uh, you can test uh, locally you can test it on azure uh, when you deploy it as well so basically when you build application you can test it locally this particular structure, this particular 
whole programming model gives you that flexibility to test this application locally. I'll show you how to do it in, while I'm doing the demo as well. And obviously, there is a different hosting options which you have, which you can take. So ultimately, what I'm talking about is uh, you're only focused on code. You're not really doing the plumbing job, which means managing the infrastructure. So there is <clears throat> uh, no infrastructure management here. You're only focused there on your code. And it auto scales, it scales, and, it, and the workload increases. It scale, still scales, and it replicates. You can actually set, basically, you can say, I am going to scale from 1 to you know, 30 or 40 replications. Uh, all this is possible. And you are, you know, uh, your uh, code can be scaled uh, too fast as well. And again, you are not wasting money. That is the biggest thing, right? You are only you know, spending money on on the on the usage and how many people are using your app right the best suited for uh, startup and how it is uh, developed so there is a trigger which i talked about there's a simple trigger <coughs> which is it could be http it could be a cosmos db update it could be a storage update it could be a queue update anything and then there is input and output binding. When I say input binding, it could be binded to different storages or it can be binded to different set of structures which is there. And output binding, what I mean is how this can be, um, you know, uh, you know, can be used, the data which is coming out of this can be used in different services. So there is a different services which can be part of the output binding. And that is the structure here. Um, so let's go and try and build an application. And uh, I was testing this today morning as well. If somebody was following me on Twitter, so you would see this, right? So let's go and uh, you know see how exactly this works. So <clears throat> even before I, sorry, no, I mean this code is available everywhere, so no worries. Let me let me show you where you can find. Okay, so I have um, um, I have installed I have installed a couple of things. Okay, so there is um, uh, there is Azure Azure extension on my Visual Studio Code. There is function extension already installed, and there is something called as Azure Functions Code Tools for CLI. So it is also being installed on the uh, on the extension, right? As part of the extension, so it is all setup is ready here. So I'm not doing anything specific. So let me show you how to get started. So if you see here, let me close this off, and then we'll come back here. So if you see this, so uh, basically. Once you install, you can see this function app here, right? There's something called as functions, and then there is something called as workspace. So in the workspace, if you go here and click on this button, you can see create function, right? So through Visual Studio, you can just click on the create function. Obviously, you can do this via Azure portal, and there is CLI as well, support is there. So I'm just doing it through, uh, through this, uh, tool right so when I create function it will show me all the triggers which I'm going to use so you can see the triggers so here are the bunch of triggers so if you see there's blob storage trigger and I, as I was telling there is bunch of triggers right it can the event has to be triggered from somewhere so either HTTP or it can be time trigger it is nothing but a cron job kind of a thing and it can be a grid it can be queue it can be service bus. So a bunch of things are available. So you can pick and choose uh, whichever you want to uh, use. And once you choose this, all you need is uh, provide the name and then just get started with it, right? So once you give the name, it will create the service, right? So I'm not doing that because of the time, interest of the time. Uh, I've already created one uh, service there which is Wikibytes, you can see that. So that is my local. So the code is local. I mean, I, I've created the function in the local 
uh, environment that means it is still on my laptop it has not been um, you know shared across to the deployed or to the co uh, in the, uh, to the cloud okay so you can see this and when you create you'll see the code like this and by the way it depends on which programming language you have chosen while creating the workspace so the programming language i have chosen is python so that is the reason why it has given me a structure for python so you, you can see that there is requirement.txt if you create a you know uh, node.js uh, it will give you package.json right and if you create something else it gives different structure so there are a bunch of things so because i have used python for the workspace it is using the you know python uh, structure template so as a developer you already have the template right so when you go and create a function uh, on whichever programming language you are familiar with you just go and create and it just throws, gives you a simple uh, structure right so now <clears throat> you you can see that uh, code is there and this will be a default there will be a default code obviously uh, where you can test it out but i have added some code there where i want to tweet from here so it is there and you know what is what is that thing which we'll add here to tweet anyone what i need to add here let's tweet from here huh yeah hello everyone from hello everyone tell me <laughs> any 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 options online <laughs> what makes you tweet Huh? No. Okay. Let's do this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Azure. Yes. Okay. Let's read this. So now I have the code. So the the code is written very simple. I mean, uh, if you go to requirement.ps, you know, txt, I've added two things. Uh, you can see tweepy and Python deep couple are the modules which is there. So you can use those modules and obviously you can figure it out. And so I saw a couple of them uh, were asking for, for code from me. This is something which I have not written. It is already there. You know, it's, if you go to TweeP or how to use it, uh, you can use it. So there is nothing uh, Brahmastra about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let me change this view to... Okay, cool. So the code is uh, basically doing nothing. It's basically taking name and it is printing the name and other things, but I've added a tweet to it. So that's it's whenever I run this, it also runs a tweet. Uh, it, it posts a tweet on my uh, Twitter handle, okay? So here I've used all the Twitter uh, keys and other things. Obviously you can't see my key right there is a reason because i am using something called as decouple right i am using a module called as decouple there the my so that i can hide my keys otherwise everybody will start posting through my uh, twitter handle right so i've used that key so that's the thing so uh, basically we are good to go so now the code is written uh, the structure is ready and everything is ready. You're ready to go. You have the code. You have everything. So all you need to do is go back to Azure extension. And you have the functions created. So you can just go here and right click, create a function. So if you see this, you can just go and uh, create function app in Azure. Right? So you can just click on that and it gets created. So you need to off. Okay, just a minute. It's uh... okay. So there is a click. Uh, you just need to click it. So there is a simple way. Uh, once you click on that, again, it will just deploy a function to the uh, cloud. And once it is done, uh, you can push your uh, local code through this button. You see this button? You can see this. This one. 
So if you just click on that button, your code goes to the cloud. Okay. So that is a simple way. Uh, I've already done it. So I'm just going to click uh, deploy function because we changed the code. I'm selecting the same function which I'm using. So I'm selecting that. And it says, okay, deploy, okay. It says basically I'll replace the thing which is there. I'm okay with it and it is getting deployed. So the new code is going there and uh, we will see what is this new code will do. And that's, that's exactly, um, it takes some time. I don't record. <laughs> so, yeah. So let's see from my Twitter. Is there anything coming? So this is the one which I tweeted in the morning. So we will wait for the deployment to complete. So you can see the output here, actually, how exactly this is deploying. You can see a couple of things. Um, it is unpacking and unpacking and then deploying the stuff to the cloud. I'll come back um, to the cloud. So this is the link where it is uh, deployed. So I just need to copy this link and right. And I'm going to show you copying this cloud uh, code. Sorry, link, and I'm just saying name <clears throat> is equal to Vivek. So, no, just Vivek is also fine. No. Let's see. So, you can just see, you know, saying it's just a status. It is telling me uh, Vivek with the API uh, tweet testing completed, right? So it's, it's just telling me some information, but let's see on my Twitter, whether it did, it's there, no? So this is what it is. So that's what uh, functions does, right? So it's a simple job. It's a simple thing. Every time I run this particular thing, it gets tweet done. I could, I could build very complex things from here, right? All I can do is connect to a database, connect to a Cosmos DB. I could have my proper tweet, tweets set. And whenever I'm running this job, it picks up the latest tweet and runs it uh, automatically. Now I could even build it even more complex by telling, why don't you push the same content on LinkedIn, on my different, different places where my socials are there. I could build an app out of it. <laughs> Right. So all I have to do is I'm doing is just running a simple function, but it is doing much complex things uh, at the back end just by using APIs and other things uh, from different things. Right. So this is uh, what the functions can do. And this was a simple example, which I just wanted to show you. And you can run it locally as well. When I say run it locally, uh, that means you can go here. can see my, um, this is the serverless API, correct? So this is what I have the code, everything set here. I have to do function start. Okay, I'm, I'm starting in some port because I don't want to clash with the port which is there. Oh, sorry, not this one. I'm sorry. Let me do it from here because I need to install the packages, right? So I'm going to run it from here. It's the debugger which I have chosen and I can just go here and click on the start debugging and it will start debugging for me. Okay. So I can do it from here uh, easily because it, it required some packages to be installed. So I did. And it is on local now. If you see this, this is on local. 
ignore the errors which is it's showing it's on local the same thing i'm going to run oops did i miss something it should be oh no i think this this is also clashing here oh yeah let me close this let me see this this is what happens no it's not running in local hmm? i know no no ah. let me rerun it from here let's see hope it runs did it install everything required this should be fine or did i change anything in the code which is not running I don't know why it is not running in local. So <laughs> anyways, so it is running in cloud. Uh, I'll have to debug it more, but that's fine. Uh, so basically, uh, this is how you, you can do the test and verify and run it. Uh, let me go back to, because of the time, let me go back to the next set of things. Uh, you can go and take up this challenge or it, there is, um, learn it reactor we have that's exactly we are going to debug these kind of things we are going to debug hands on you can also come here and try it out uh, we have it next week uh, Friday you can try the functions on your own there will be sandboxes available for you so you can easily try all of these things so next Friday we are meeting here mm -hmm. again uh, only to do this hands on so and obviously it is available online as well so you can obviously uh, attend online as well if you are willing to try it online otherwise you can be here build it deploy it spend three hours four hours five hours the reactor is open uh, on that day okay so a couple of um, sample examples of which i wanted to show you was the web application backend so the what it does is basically if you have an online ordering system right uh, and if you see here, it's a simple request which you can make. And there is a HTTP trigger. There's a function. It is just storing data, right? Whenever you do an online ordering or anything. So these are the couple of examples. Right? Then there is mobile application backend. If you are building an application, mobile application backend, say, for example, your friends, you have gone outside and you know you, you want to send notification to all of your friends to pay back these many, <laughs> this, you know, this is the cost. And uh, if you want to send notifications, you can still build this through an app, right? So that is how what it is doing. So if you see, there are different set of triggers, basically. The, one is getting triggered from a Cosmos DB trigger. The other is getting triggered from a HTTP trigger. So there are different set of triggers being used in the same application. And it does two different jobs. And it runs two different things. But it is, at the end of the day, if you see, it's sending notification. Um, similarly, in our manufacturing industry as well, there is anomaly detection happening. So there is a, you know, IoT hub. You are sending in data, and there is a, some condition. At some condition, it gets triggered, and the function is getting triggered to send a message uh, to the person who is supposed to fix those problems. So all of these things can be built uh, through functions. You don't really need an infrastructure. You don't need to create a VM or create something else where it is always running for, uh, you know, and you're paying for it. And these things never happen, right? So these things never send out, right? You never send out any of these things, right? So similarly, uh, in hospitals as well, right? You know, sorry, in the vacation uh, planning system or uh, importantly in uh, healthcare as well, right? So there is a bunch of PDFs you want to uh, work with and uh, you store it in some blob storage. And this is a blob storage trigger, which is an example of blob storage trigger where uh, data is there in the blob storage and 
uh, basically it is getting pulled and here is where cognitive services are coming as well you can run through cognitive services and uh, store it in databases so yeah so a bunch of things like this uh, you know the uh, you know when you are scheduling task or real time streaming process you are running couple of uh, things to build dashboards or you are running some saas applications uh, is where you can use uh that's that's something which you can do and uh, you know any questions you have uh, do let me know so i'll take the online questions first because there's a bunch of uh, questions would be there and then i'll come back to you uh, and after the event also i can be here so that's the reason is bunch of people <laughs> okay 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 this <laughs> bunch of questions there which i will answer through uh, chat itself um, so it will take a lot of time to answer those things uh, yes so the question here is can i build a app where i can schedule i can schedule and uh, create a scheduler to uh, post something onto my social handles yes you can do it uh you can use bunch of triggers as well like like the timer trigger as well if you want to schedule it or uh you can use the normal trigger which i have used um and also run it whenever on requirement basis uh that is also been you can do it when you say what do you mean by connection between apps let's say let's say i want to take data from one of the app to the other app and there is no key currently for that huh. can we use azure yes to... definitely it is been used one of the use cases you saw right you can push all the data to the blob storage and from blob storage you can trigger it to azure uh, through the uh, uh, through the functions and you can basically structure it and store it in cosmos db or any other places huh. you can definitely zapier is just an integration tool and you can you can definitely build it through functions using logic apps as well but again these are all a uh, set of things you can use in different different use cases there are bunch of use cases so uh, you have to go through these the use cases which is there and there are best practices because you can do it in different different ways you can obviously go back and pay for zapier and use it as well so otherwise you can use it through building your own functions or you can use probably logic apps as well build it with different integrations with logic apps uh based on your integrations your requirement is yeah there is something called as durable functions uh where you can uh have the states maintained between different functions and then uh update it as well so there is there is a way to do it uh i haven't shown that here because of the complexity it will bring in for the first timers right if if you're not familiar with functions as a as a or as a as a platform uh it will it will add complexity so that is the reason why we didn't discuss it probably we can discuss that when we do the learnet reactor next week we can definitely do that any other question it's uh, it's basically different consumption plans are available 
so you can take a look at that uh, some of these uh, you can run it as an app service plan where there is a free trial as well otherwise yeah <coughs> yeah so i'll i'll the while we are discussing uh, i will let the other speaker come here and he set up his setup because i'm going to go offline from this now so the speaker will come here so <coughs> while you can still ask questions here i can Share your screen. Just play this. Uh, you need to add a screen. Yeah, everyone, good evening for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, uh, before going into a topic, I want to introduce myself actually. Uh, I am Tarunan Ganesan. I am having around uh, 8.5 years of experience in the industrial in the internet of things. And then actually, I have been currently working in uh, LNT Infotech as uh, the specialist in. Uh, and Ministry of Internet of Things and been handling around uh, yeah, three to four teams uh, of developers. And then also, actually, um, if you think I have been uh, predominantly working on Microsoft uh, based on IoT services like Azure IoT Hub and then uh, Azure Event Hub, storage accounts, and then uh, Azure Digital Twins, GDX clusters, Databricks, etc. And then, actually, if you see um, now today, actually, what topic we are going to see is actually is current, uh, it's about. Uh, um, the Azure Digital Twins, actually. I actually, why I chosen this topic is actually since um, Microsoft has been uh, predominantly giving updates about this Digital Twins uh, in the in the past is uh, yeah five to six months actually. So the, so so I thought actually uh, it's a right time for um, uh, to tell the uh, people or the tech, tech 
technologies to actually go up in our own uh, and uh, and predominantly using these Microsoft services for the IoT based projects. And moreover, what is the importance of using this uh, Azure Digital Twins in your uh, project is actually you can visualize your uh, 3D model of your asset, and we can also uh, it's been used to see um, the real time data, the telemetry data which is coming into your uh, which is coming from your asset actually will be new in a 3D model. And moreover, actually, um, since actually it is invented actually uh, so that it's not necessary for a um, workman to go to the um, the many type of yeah, fields and you need to monitor the things on the manual part actually so this is what actually we are going to see in this um, next 45 minutes and it it's also include some uh, demo as well um so in, in this demo actually if you see um i will be talking about uh yeah how to create um uh, yeah azure Dig digital twin instance and I also I also will tell you about uh, what is a young uh, Azure Digital Twin Explorer and how the DTDL uh, DTDL models has been created actually and which format you need to create this DTDL models and what are the components which needs to be there in the DTDL model which is necessary for creating the 2D graphs for this uh, Digital Twin Data Explorer and then actually at last section we have been going to see about it. it PD scene giver actually. This PD scene giver is nothing but is a kind of a studio which is introduced by Microsoft to uh, see the 3D based um, model of your uh, uh, assets uh, um, uh, which you are going to monitor or you are going to uh, do some um, um, configurations and all actually. So let's move on to the topic. Um, Okay, actually, um, if you see um, the the PD model might be any type of assets like you are building or f uh, factories or farms or energy models, etc. And also, if you see, um, it is used to this um, Azure Digital Twin will be used to expand your. Uh, IoT cloud architecture actually in a wider space by implementing this PD models in your applications or solution. Uh, and then actually, if you see, um, most of them actually will be uh, get confused in regarding this device twin and a digital twin. Actually, the IoT device twin is nothing but the uh, device twin which has the properties of your device which is get, getting created in your IoT. But if you see the digital thing is a completely different from the device thing that it, uh, yeah, it will only actually um, use a TV model in the presentation along with the telemetry data uh, they coming into your uh, um, uh, your cold part and hot part of your uh, architecture actually. So this is a difference of this uh, uh, the, uh, the difference between this IoT twin and the digital twin actually. 
okay uh, if i include uh, um, digital twin in my architecture actually uh, what are the benefits the client can be able to achieve uh, is a question will come across in every projects actually like uh, uh, yeah because actually yeah we are investing this much money in this uh, particular service uh, but what, what is the outcome I, i can get it for uh, as in return of my in, in investment like that this kind of questions will come so yeah for it if you see um uh, it will bring the um, uh, any environment to the live and it also will make the things in a uh, uh, scalable and a secure manner actually and it also has a, um it it will help us to uh, connect uh, the in existing assets which are uh, available in your uh, in existing environments actually then it also uh, 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 used to build in any system in a robustable manner actually and then if you see um, in in actually this um, uh, azure digital twin uh, data explorer if you see we can be able to query the uh, each and every telemetry data which is coming into a a particular asset actually so these are actually um, it's a, it's an important one actually where a, uh, a particular developer can be able to check and see actually if the data flow is continuous or not in their assets if, if in case actually this data flow is not um, uh, continuous means actually yeah, yeah they can set up an alert and they can bring it can be alerted to the respective teams for um, making the things in a good way actually and then after, and if you see um it can also be integrated with uh, ai services ml services and then actually analytics services and data services of azure as well actually so these are some of the advantages of the digital twin and then if you see um this digital twin uh, will be working on some models actually okay uh, in this models actually you need to yeah follow up yeah particular thing called like dtdl dtdl is nothing but is uh, it's a digital twin definition language, language actually where the uh, data should be given in the form of a json with which some components has to be um, followed actually so in an upcoming yeah, slides actually we are going to see that only before and all if you see uh, the before in the introduction of this 3d sync studio of um, azure digital twin actually we uh, need to write this model uh, manually and we need to upload it into the data explorer actually but if you see now actually um, since the pd scene has some uh, uh, yeah, features to upload the data directly to that uh, configuration page and then we, it will be directly um, uh, generating this model file actually and in term of uh, uh, scaling out time by writing it in a manual one actually and if you see um, what are of formats will be uh, accepted uh, uh, in this digital twin explorer yeah what types of file formats i can be able to upload means actually if you see you can upload the json file format and in excel formats for uh, in, in your digital twin explorer to get the models to be uploaded to make a graph actually okay and then uh, if you see uh, there are some elements of dtdl which has to be mandatorily followed by creating a, your uh, dtdl uh, based uh, uh, model structure uh, uh, some of them are actually uh, this some of the main one actually uh, it, it has so many things actually but uh, these are the uh most followed components of uh, the dtdl language like uh, interface telemetry relationship property command and the component actually so if you see uh, if you are going to write a particular dtdl based um, um uh the json format means i think this type of uh, components are mandatorily has to be there so it will be it will be easy for your models to be mapping with their respective twins when you're creating a graph actually so yeah we will see one by one if you see um um if uh, uh, we can speak about in interface actually first uh, the interface is nothing but actually it's a it's a kind of representation of a particular uh, uh, contents of the digital twin like it's properties or inheritance etc and then actually this in, uh, interface can be be used for this theme of our components in another interface also actually yeah for example if i have an interface called 
thermostat this thermostat interface can be used in the another interface uh, uh, or another uh, and DDDL style as well, actually. So this is uh, about this interface. And then actually, if you see, um, the telemetry is in another component. For example, if you see, uh, my type can be a telemetry or property, actually. Telemetry means actually it will not, uh, after, after example, if my data is coming from an IoT hub, actually. So it has been ingested to a, um, um, a digital twin, actually. In that case, actually, the digital twin won't store the data instead actually it, it, it will keep on utilizing the data values only actually instead of um, providing the storage part actually so in this case telemetry will be a very useful one if you have a, a millions of devices connected and it it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, sending the data to this uh, digital twins actually command if you see um, it's a type of uh, function or type actually uh, which needs to be performed in your uh, uh, DTDL model yeah, yeah, file actually. For example, if you see, um, I have a command called uh, dboot actually. Okay, in that action, I have been need to give a uh, description called a request time to dboot the device. And, and uh, how the schema has to be, it should be a date time actually. At, what date and time actually it has been debuted. So this is the uh, format of the command uh, uh, which we are giving it to the DDL model actually. And then if you see um, property, uh, any property of your uh, ding, 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 visual pin uh, yeah, has the read rate of um, operations actually. Yeah, for example, uh, yeah, I have a property called temperature, uh, which can be only a read only uh, or a, uh, yeah, I have a property called device ID, which can be a need only actually. But uh, uh, if I have a property called uh, non or off, actually, this can be a writable actually. Uh, I can be able to write that property as a non or off actually, based upon my uh, machine status or the um, the status of my uh, the missionaries uh, has to be utilized in the future actually. So these are the things. Uh, um, if you see, uh, um, will be play a major role uh, while creating this DDDL model. And next one, if you are going to uh, see is in relationship. Yeah, for example, relationship is nothing but kind of an inheritance kind of uh, uh, one actually. If you see, um, for example, I have one uh, uh, house in a second floor actually. Okay, in that house, I have a number of rooms like kitchen, um, bedroom one, bedroom two, et cetera. Okay. But, uh, the main uh, pin in that uh, uh, particular model will be my house number two, actually. So that this uh, room number one, room number two, kitchen, and hall and all will come under as a relationship to this uh, house number two, actually, which is at this second floor. So in, in that case, you can map uh, a n number of relations between uh, n number of digital twins based upon their uh, um, Based upon their actually uh, their um, uh, commands or any type of uh, uh, the business use cases actually okay so and then if you see uh, uh, we are going to uh, ask the about uh, um, component component is nothing but actually it will describes us clearly uh, the connectivity between the two interfaces actually okay so this. The component will play a major role. For example, uh, the component one actually interfaces with the component two means actually the component two has the um, uh, the properties of the component one as well. Actually, so this is the purpose of this uh, component tag in this uh, DDL model. Okay, next we will be uh, screening a small demo actually in, yeah, in which I will be sh yeah, yeah, showing how to create this digital twin explorer, digital twin instance, and this PD scene uh, by using some one yeah, small IoT based use case actually. Okay, like this only actually this digital twin explorer will be there, and like this only actually your uh, PD scenes. Uh, uh, um, the uh, build view will be there actually. So these things we yeah, we will be doing it now in this demo actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Portal. Yeah. It's on portal. No. No. It, yeah. It's on portal actually.
Uh, before going to this actually creation of this uh, Azure Digital Twin, yeah, yes, okay. Yeah, you can create a TD based model actually. Can you, can you repeat the question to the online audience as well? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, what is the question you asked actually? Can you please tell me? Okay, actually, this is a question based by Mr. Uh, Mr. Roy, that actually that um, yeah, there are, we need to use only the coordinates based in Excel uh, data only to create this models, or actually we can use a real time key captured data also for this models. Actually, yeah, we, we can use to go the things actually. Okay, before actually, if you see, um, only a 2D based model was available. In that case, actually, uh, only the Excel or this real based based on formats are used. But now, if you see, the, uh, once in, uh, one, once uh, after this introduction of this 3D scene, you can create a 3D model of your asset actually, uh, which should be in the format of yeah, dot .glb actually, uh, 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 which is a 3D printing. Uh, um, uh, uh, extension of format actually, I, uh, I hope so. Uh, 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 right, it is used means actually it, uh, this extension will be very much clear and it's uh, very small in size as well, actually. So, those, so only this dot VLB based uh, uh, 3D models are used actually, okay. And it can be created uh, using your uh, 3D paint itself, actually, which is available uh, from your uh, Windows 11, okay. So, go to things are possible actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, Nocolas also it's a, it's a, 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 a style which you are getting rendered in Nocolas or any gear where device should be in the format of that, uh, that, uh, 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 the, uh, the dot the GLB actually. So if you get those, yeah, styles means actually of a particular real um, model means actually it is better actually you can upload that uh, same thing to your. Uh, uh, this PDC and you, uh, you can map the elements and all actually. So that's what we uh, we are now going to see actually yeah, how it will be done like that actually. Okay. Yeah. Before uh, yeah yeah before going into it actually uh, yeah whenever you are actually uh, going to create any new services in your Azure portal or uh, you, you are going to create any services for your project or you, you need to create a new resource group actually. Okay. Yes. 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 Already it will be easy for you to. Uh, give access for your particular team members or anyone kind of or for the costing purpose also it can be utilized. So in that case, actually, I created a uh, resource group called ADT Reactor. Okay, in the none of this ADT Reactor action, I have been I created a, a digital twin called ADT Reactor Bangalore Twin. Actually, okay. So how I created this one I means actually you have uh, 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 since an ADT is is a Azure Digital Twin is a Pass service. If you go here and you can type, choose the digital bin and create. You need to give your uh, subscription and your which resource under which resource group you need to create the twin. And then actually, uh, what is the name of your GDT uh, instance? And then your region under which region. You are. And please. Uh, Without any target, please tick mark this because uh, uh, once you give the owner role to your Azure, Azure Digital Twin only, actually, it can be able to get the data with, uh, yeah, without any seamless from your uh, Azure IoT Hub or new on top like that, actually. Okay, so this is how I created uh, uh, the Azure Digital Twin. So if you see, um, after you giving this, give you please create actually that a uh, digital twin will be created. Uh, so one once the deployment is completed, if you see, um, it will look like this. Okay. Like it will look like this with this uh, host name. It's a host name will be, it's very much important actually. It will be used in various places of uh, uh, creating the screen models and all. So please make a note of this uh, host name. And also actually, if you see you, um, here actually in, um, you'll be having an open Azure Digital Twin Explorer actually. So if I click this actually, it will open this Explorer for me. 
okay uh, did, this uh, explorer actually did gives you the entire view how the 2d models are created so before going into this actually i will tell you um, how i generated this uh, telemetry data but by means of some simulator actually okay so if you see um, this is a data pusher simulator uh, which is uh, yeah uh, which is uh, yeah, used by microsoft uh, to create a quick simulator actually uh, uh, for some tocs and all okay so if you see here um uh once the, this stage gets loaded actually you can see um it will uh yeah ask for your uh, digital twins instance url actually and it also ask uh, what kind of stimulation type you want you want gobotomes or dairy yeah facility uh, I, i'm actually do, yeah, yeah, currently going with the robotic arms actually and then this instance url has to be taken from here actually the uh, our host name only is the instance url of your uh, the azure digital twin Okay, once, once if I give this actually and generate an environment means actually it will create an environment of uh, um, packaging a uh, 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 physical uh, actually and with with the robotic norms of uh, 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 five to six uh, machines will be created actually by sending some random telemetric data to my uh, digital twins actually. Uh, so if you see um, once if I create a generate in environment and start stimulation so the data here actually uh, uh, if you see here um, like this actually the model will be created uh, in my ppt if you see i might have actually speaking about this models and all the new model uh, if i see by creating this new uh, model uh, the components the interface relationship uh, yeah which and all i have been told here has been created but earlier if you see actually this uh, uh, style has to be manually created by the uh, developer and it needs to be uploaded and mapped to your uh, digital twin explorer so since this uh, um, data simulator has been introduced by microsoft now my job is getting completed easily actually by giving the what kind of simulation type i want actually in me which environment okay and then if you see um, if you click uh, each and every uh, this is a distribution center which has actually uh, six robotic arms okay inside is the dt dt id means actually the digital twin id of this uh, um, uh, this model is actually dist ctr actually okay this uh, distribution center has been connected to six uh, robotic arms actually which generates a data of uh, uh, yeah uh, yeah how many pickups has been failed in the last hour and what is the hydraulic pressure and uh, yeah uh, how much knowledge has been sent actually uh, uh, while the failure has been happened and then actually if you see actually uh, which box id has been uh, failed to pick up like that and all the data will be generating here from the simulator actually okay so this is the 2d model representation of your uh, um azure digital twin model which is associated to this uh, distribution center uh, robotic norm uh, simulation type actually okay so if you go want to see the td model of this means actually you need to uh, get the td model uh, of this uh, particular uh, robotic model distribution center area which contains six uh, robotic norms actually so, okay and then actually that has to be Tear into a tear scenes actually. So next we are going to see that one. Yeah, before going into that actually, yeah, we need to create a storage account uh, container. So which which gets the type tiles of the um, this tear scenes uh, uh, tool actually. Okay. So actually, yeah, I have been set my subscription ID as this actually, and then I think I want to now. Create a storage account for this uh, particular resource group and its subscription. So, if you see here, um, it can be created uh, like uh, using your uh, 
Azure TLA as well, and it can be created using your uh, um, uh, your uh, uh, the Azure portal as well. Actually, okay. So if you see here, uh, I am creating it here using the CLI. So it will be it will be easy for yeah for us to assign the ownerships and all actually, and the access related policies as well actually. Be creating as use to east us and then actually if you see um so it will create my uh azure digital twin um storage account actually in my resource group edit reactor so take some time once this has been completed actually it will be giving the id of your storage container so that has to be noted down actually yeah yes Yeah, anything uh, uh, which is based on your uh, use case, actually, you, you can create it, actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, actually, yeah, as of now, Microsoft believes to two uh, stimulated uh, types only, like robotic arm, which is ticking the box, actually. And it's also, uh, yeah, dairy farm based. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, dairy farm based actually um, once stimulated type actually. So in yeah future we uh, we are expecting a lot of uh, um, stimulators like this. It's like you've been uh, you've been uh, if you are uh, working in this IoT accelerators actually. So if you see we, we have n number of stimulators has been designed by Microsoft actually, which is closely associated and sending the data to the IoT center service actually in Azure. So like that, they are actually trying to build it. Uh, 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 once it's completed, actually, uh, we can create, uh, we can get n number of simulators. In case, if you, yeah, there is no any particular simulator which suits your use case means actually, you can create your own DTTL model in your, uh, uh, using a JSON or the engineering mapping of an Excel and all. Now you can still upload that into your digital twin explorer actually. So don't the ways it's been uh, working out actually. So if you want to customize your loose case and then you need to do it as well actually. Which one? Yeah, actually Spidey would be a good uh, uh, option. Once of uh, the evolution of uh, the uh, of the the ID was more actually in that case if you see um this uh, digital twin uh distributed viewers and all actually we using the gear we are a device also will be a boom actually in the world okay so it's taking some time to pay the storage account okay let it be i will also uh, you you will just, We'll actually, yeah, uh, yeah, show you the 3D scenes in the environment. Actually, where the 3D scenes uh, uh, will be created. Actually, if you see, um, I already have a storage container in my account, so I am making utilize of it instead of waiting for it. So if you see, um, container has been created. And then actually, if you see, there's a HTTPS and then you see address of the container will be mapped here actually.
so i can keep my container name as uh, to add this container to my actually uh, the visual twin the, the, the course has been enabled first actually and then only actually if you see this uh, uh, there will be a, there won't be any flawless uh, activities will get happen you see if, if a course is not handled here actually uh, the the data will not be blended with our td uh, scenes actually So my session got expired actually in here. So I will be re-logging in. Okay. Okay, once I give um and what is private or public? It's actually in public action. I need to send this into private one actually. Okay, I don't know what's the is might be my access issue. I hope so actually. So if you see actually once we give this URLs here actually, uh, it will ask for your dot the DLB file to get uploaded actually. So once your dot DLB file got uploaded actually, this uh, uh, as I mentioned in this uh, uh, KPT actually, you will be able to see this uh, entire. Uh, uh, the 3D models, and then um, if you click on each um, and this robotic DOM, actually, yeah, yeah, you can view what kind of events has been triggered, which any colors um, has been triggered or not, as uh, uh, can also be viewed on this plot, actually. So this is what actually uh, the the 3D screen, uh, uh, the tool of uh, the measure has been performing now, actually. So this is about the digital things of measure. So yeah, is there any questions? So, 
Yeah, uh, uh, Scotts, yeah. Actually, IoT Central, actually, if you see, um, can be connected to this digital twin section. You, you can send the data from your IoT Central also to this uh, digital twin, and from IoT Hub also, you can send directly, or by means of new one tab and Azure functions also. Uh, 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 you can send the data directly from here. Actually, you can able to egress the data to your Azure Data Explorer, Azure Synapse, and all actually for some analytics and AI based services. So, different uh, models of no, actually, uh, it's actually completely based on real time data which is coming from your asset actually or from your simulator. So it, it's actually completely associated with IoT based uh, ecosystem only. Yeah, time series insights actually it's completely uh, it's kind of in visualization the tool like our Power BI that we can do, do some analytics based upon your requirements actually but this is actually completely it's a, it's a kind of 3d visualization of your asset which is in front of you so which, which tells about uh, the various big data which is coming from your uh, telemetry to your uh, model in the presentation actually so both are different actually Yeah, thank you everyone. Actually, it's been great in uh, uh, presenting this topic of uh, Azure Ding Ding, yeah, digital things. Thank, thank, thank you for this opportunity for the Microsoft Day Actor. Actually, uh, thank you so much, team. Yeah, bye. Take care.